Okay, good morning. Uh, I guess I better turn the clock on here. Uh, the uh, Some of the stuff we went over last week, uh, if, if you didn't, if you weren't here, and it's online now, and you can listen to it then. Uh, we're talking about going through this book as a survey instead of a verse-by-verse -verse, uh, type of study because uh, we want to try to get through it because we've got so many other things we want to do teaching-wise that we, we, we really can't spend more than a year, year and a half on this at the very most. We're going to try to get it through in a year if we can, but uh, I'm not going to be legalistic about that, but I do want to get it right. So... This is important, and uh, it's important that we understand exactly what we're doing. So I, I wrote some things up here uh, kind of to give you some points that we're working through. These are the first 15 verses of the book, Romans chapter 1, 1 through 15. And, and it's broken down this way this morning for you. Uh, Paul's apostleship, and we put down here the author. The writer addresses everybody in the first seven verses. Then in the next few verses, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, he addresses his audience, the people who he's writing to. So he's going to say a few things about himself here and about you know, what is happening with him and who he is, and he's making kind of a declaration. And then also he's going to talk to the audience and, and talking to them about the idea of establishing them in the faith being the goal and thanking God for them. But remember, these people that were at Rome, this, these group of churches that were at Rome, and, and the main body of these people that were at Rome, Paul had really never been there to see them. So he gets there, and, and what he finds is the, the product of his own ministry before he ever gets a chance to go there and see them. And so this thing's growing and growing and growing uh, on its own without him. And so when he gets there, uh, you know, it's a great time. As a matter of fact, he, I, I see him in the book of Acts on the ship, and as he comes in, there's a crowd on, on the, the shoreline, or on the, I would probably say it's, it's probably a, a dock or a pier, and uh, there's a place there called Three Taverns, and Paul sees them. And it's always heartwarming to me that here he's been on this long journey, and he's been on this sea journey on a ship, and, and every time you went out on a ship in those days, you risk your life. And so, you know, they, they get there, and he sees this crowd waiting for him. And they're waiting for him. Now, they didn't know. How are you supposed to know when a ship's going to get there? They're not GPSing. They're not, they don't have phones. They don't have any of that. They just, they just are looking for him, you know? And when he sees them, it says that he took courage. I love that. He took courage because he saw the brethren. When you, when you, when you see that, when you read that, you, you appreciate as a preacher or a pastor or somebody who's teaching the Bible, you appreciate the idea of having some audience. Now, I'm going to tell you, I preached for about two years uh, doing radio broadcasts. I was preaching at Suncoast, but I was doing radio broadcasts, so I'm preaching to an audience at the church. But I, I preached my radio broadcast without any audience. I preached it in my office. And my radio broadcast was done, uh, it was an AM broadcast, and we were, we were reaching, the, the most people we reached during that time was uh, people in the prison system. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the men in the jails were, were sending us letters because they were listening on the AM channel. And uh, the broadcast was 15 minutes. That's how long I had to preach. So I had about 13 or 14 minutes of actual intro, outro, and teaching. And then there was some other stuff, that, that you know, information about the group that was put on the end of it. And I learned how to get through a message quickly. Now, you would not maybe know that by the fact that we have a whole slew of one hour and ten minute messages or 105. Last week I did 55 minutes. It's natural for me to, to try to do it in about 45 to 50 minutes, but it's not always possible and it doesn't happen. Uh, and, and so we try to keep it where it's supposed to be. But, you know, it's encouraging when you have people to talk to. But it's also possible to teach even when there's nobody there. Because once you take over and you see your audience in your mind and you've been getting letters and you're reading those letters from them, it's fantastic to know there is somebody going to listen to this somewhere down the line. So I hope that if you're listening today, 
uh, that you understand the importance of the book of Romans and how important it is that you learn this book. And, and so surveying the book is the best way, I think, because you can get the big picture view and it helps in the process of establishment. And if you will learn this book, uh, it will make the rest of Paul's epistles go a lot quicker. In uh, verse 13 to 15, verses 13 to 15 in chapter 1, he's going to talk about his purpose. And that purpose in, in, in writing to them, number one is he couldn't get there to see them. But the other thing was to have fruit among them. He wants them to be fruitful. And Paul's group there in Rome, uh, operating in, in really within the lion's den, they say, in Nero's time, in Caligula's time, in uh, Caesar's time. He lived under three of the greatest despots that ever lived on the planet Earth. And his ministry went on and forward until its very end without being, uh, I would say, uh, hindered too much. He did, he did finish it. He says, I finished my course with joy. So Paul did finish his ministry. It took him about 30 years to do it. However, when he did that, we learned that, that everything that Jesus Christ wanted us to hear, we heard it. It's been written down. There's nothing here uh, that, that he didn't want us to hear, and there's nothing missing that he did want us to hear. It's all here for us today. And we saw last week in chapter 1 those, those three revelations. Let's go back and review that, and then we'll get started on the rest of this. Chapter 1, verse 4, he talks about the declaration. And this declaration is a very important declaration, and it is a revelation from God. It's a public declaration. And he says, and we talked about the, the issue of the, the, the combination of, issues in the gospel, those things that, that we take from the gospel of the kingdom and those things that we take from the gospel of the grace of God, they have some common denominators. The cross is a common denominator. They didn't know that at the time they were doing their ministry back here. Paul explained that to them, and then they figured out how it's going to fit in over here. So when you look at this, you see, well, they preach those things but they were concerning the kingdom. The focus was not the cross to those people. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the story of the cross. It records the history and the actual uh, uh, details of the event, yes. But the secret purpose of the cross, the secret purpose of why God did this, could not have been revealed because Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 2 that had the princes of this world known this, had Pilate, had Herod, had these people known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I think when Paul writes that, and he, and he gets you into the mind of God before it's put into Scripture, meaning into the heart of God, where the mystery is, is hidden, you realize that why would he say such a thing if it weren't true? Did it rely upon Judas to do this? Did it require the participation of Satan himself to enter into Judas Iscariot and do this dirty deed? Well, evidently it did. See, God works out all things after the counsel of his own will. And he looks forward, as men play chess, they look forward in the game. They're four or five moves ahead, and they're looking anticipating, trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do if that happens and what they're going to do when this happens. Well, God already knows exactly what he's going to do when these things happen because he knows everything that's going to happen. He doesn't have to sit there and wonder what move is going to be made against him. He already knows the end from the beginning. So he's got the advantage. But Satan does have a free will. That's how sin came into the universe. And so if he decided not to do it, what would have happened? they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. So something else would have to be done. And so you see, this is a very complex thing and how God takes the wise in his own craftiness when he gets Satan this way, Satan thinks he's winning when he gets him on the cross. But he didn't win. Matter of fact, if you'll turn over to Colossians chapter 2 quickly and we'll, we'll show you, give you a preview of the thinking of this and this is advanced thinking a little bit before... You know, we haven't gotten to the cross yet in Romans, but in, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says it this way. 
In verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, that's the law, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to where? His cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, when did he do that? When he said it's finished, they were done. He should have said, you're finished. <laughs> but he said, it is finished. And he says, blotting out those handwriting of ordinances, and he talks about those things which are contrary to us that we can't do the law, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What destroyed Satan's kingdom? What destroyed the principalities, powers, and dominions in the heavenly places? It was the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul says that the preaching of the cross is his message. That's what this book is all about. It is the beginning of the understanding of what that iconic symbol really means. The cross means a lot of things to a lot of different people. When you see this cross right here, Remember that one? We had that one on airplanes in World War II, didn't we? And before that, we had another one, the German cross before that. They had a cross. And then when they're flying around uh, fighting the British in the sky, their planes had crosses on them. So we had planes with crosses on them shooting against planes with crosses on them. Does that make any sense to you? This thing right here is an ancient symbol, and it has nothing to do with... Uh, what you think it does, because that, that basically was just, you know, plagiarized by the Nazis. They wanted to use it. But that is a symbol of the cross broken. That's a symbol of the cross mangled. Take the cross and mangle it and say, hey, I don't believe any of that. That's, that's what Satan thought he was going to do. He's going to put him on that cross, and he's going to do everything he can to get him on that cross, and when he gets him on there, he's going to kill him. You know... It's fascinating to me that when he talks about the preaching of the cross, that it is so foolish for when people hear it, and he says it, he says the foolishness of the cross is, is it's just, it's widespread. The, it's not that it's actually foolish, it's just thought of as foolish. The foolish nation is called that little flock. They're called the foolish nation. Not because they were foolish in believing the message of God, but because they were considered to be foolish. And if you preach the cross of Christ today, you're going to be considered a fool. And people don't want to be considered fools. They don't want to be put in the wrong category as Christians. What kind of Christian do you want to be? Some people want to be maybe like Creflo Dollar. My wife was reading me something yesterday, and we were kind of laughing out loud that Creflo, he's had a couple of close calls with his jet. I mean, his wife and children were in that jet one day, and it ran off the runway, and man, he had a big problem. But God caused a miracle. And that miracle was a big blessing to him. And, and then they had another problem with the jet. The jet's getting old. Long story short, they need 60 million bucks for a new Gulf Star. So I guess we're going to have to do a message like Ray Stevens had, would Jesus wear a Rolex? We'll just have to do, you know, would Jesus fly a Gulf Star? If that's the way you've got to have it, and he preaches the prosperity myth, you see where Christianity can go to one extreme over here? People like that. But what happens when you say, I want you to come over here and be at the other end? When Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, he's not, he's not saying to people, follow what I say, doctrinally or dispensationally. He's telling them to live your life in a pattern that I'm laying down for you. And you go look at Paul's life, and it's not a pattern you'll want to follow. It's not a pattern you'll like. He said, I have suffered the loss of all things. And man, you start looking at those things that happened to him, and man, I tell you what, Paul, Paul was so embarrassed by some of the things people were saying about him, it got him riled up. <laughs> he didn't just get embarrassed, but he got mad. The Corinthians were so ashamed of him because of his 
his lack of bodily presence. I think that's kind of weird, don't you? In such a day of tolerance that we have that they thought he was such a, a, a lowlifer. You know, he's trailer trash. He's, he's some sort of weirdo. He, his bodily presence is weak, they said. He doesn't live under the same premise that we live at Corinth with all this you know, bastion of wisdom and knowledge and education and all these things. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul just, just tears all that up. When he says, follow me as I follow Christ, he's talking about living your life without thinking that gain is equated with God. Uh, Jason said it well this morning when he talked about equating the work of the flesh with something that God's doing. It's the same way. I mean, you, you can take that about 14 different ways, and, and God will give you that many ways to look at it if you just want to look at the verses. See, th there is a thing here as he addresses them where he talks to them about who he is, who he's uh, talking to, and, and what his goal is for them and, and the end purpose of that. And as he goes through it and he begins to open it up in that first chapter, he says there is a revelation that you've got to get. Look at, uh, go back to Romans chapter 1. And he's talking about his son. This gospel message concerns his son, Jesus Christ, in verse 3, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The declaration here is very, very similar to the declaration of you being justified before God. When God declares you to be just, everything else follows. Everything else comes from that. Jason was right this morning when he said it. You get salvation because you're justified. And you get all the things you get from God because first you must be just. And that is the issue with God. And when he justifies you, he declares you to be righteous. How righteous? As righteous as his own son. Well, here is the actual declaration by Paul telling you that God the Father has now demonstrated through a declaration that his son is his son, and he's his son what? The son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Do you realize that this is a message that he has received for all people? Look at verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. If you go back over to Romans 16, you'll see that he says it again in the closing. So in the book of Romans, he makes a declaration about this resurrection of Jesus Christ and that it, this is to be believed, he says. He says that he has received that grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, he says. And in Romans chapter 16, he says it again, verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, what? It's made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What do you see in the dispensation of grace after 20 centuries of preaching the cross? What do you see in 2015? I'll tell you what I see. I see fat cats in the church buying jets. I see people preaching false doctrine. I find it difficult to find the gospel of grace of God without having to go look for it. What I see is failure. And I say that only from the sense that I'm looking at it from a viewpoint that demonstrates that all of God's programs with man have ended in failure, and this one is no different. Now, it won't end for fa in failure for us. We've already got the victory. We've already received everything we're ever going to receive. We're already more than conquerors, the, those that are in Christ. But this failure, this, this complete and total failure in this dispensation is really kind of an uh, a, a interesting thing because it, it, it's, it's a demonstration of Saul himself. He was a complete failure. As a Jew, he didn't even believe God. 
And then he gets saved and he becomes the apostle. And he, it seemingly looks as though he's a failure and all that because everything he did before he almost ever even finished it, it was being undone by everybody else. He ends in failure. How does he end his life in, sec, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Turn over there and look at this. This is so strange. When you compare Romans 1 with 2 Timothy 4 and you see this great dissertation by Paul on the cross and the gospel, the grace of God, and you say, wow, this is fantastic. This is a glorious thing. And yet, when you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not, only, not to me only, but unto all them also, he says, that love his appearing. What appearing is that? That's the appearing that he made right here to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. When you love that message that, and, and that point where it comes to him, that's going to serve you well. And he says, it's going to be given to all those. Notice, he says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Why? Because for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. These guys are all out doing the work of the ministry. He's basically alone, but he says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. He's got his doctor with him, and that's it. You see, he's tying up loose ends here. He's... He's getting ready to leave. The time of my departure is at hand. That's a mariner's term. It means to lift anchor and sail away. We don't have to worry about lifting anchor. We cut the rope, man. <laughs> God takes us up. We're not going to have to worry about letting no anchor in, bringing some anchor into the boat. He's talking about leaving, but he's also talking about leaving all this ministry behind. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, he says, for, it is, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And he talks about all these ministry issues as you go through here, and it's fascinating to me that he's, he's really, he's getting his affairs in order, is what he's doing. He, he's telling Timothy, listen, this is on your shoulders now, son. I, I, he wrote to him, as I told you before, in 1 Timothy, that things are falling apart, but in 2 Timothy, it crashed, they've already fallen down. It was about two years apart between those two books. And, and in that short period since he wrote the first one, this, this second one comes and things are just completely down. He knows he's going. And uh, he's already escaped. Uh, if you go up over to uh, the uh, book, go back to 1 Timothy, he, he, he talks about his first time. He was a good lawyer, no doubt. That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? The idea of being a skilled lawyer, that's what we should say. <laughs> First Timothy chapter, look at the end, chapter 6. He talks about this, and, and he's over in, uh, yeah, go down to... Uh, uh, verse 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I, gave thee, I give thee charge in the sight of God, and quickeneth, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. And you see that good confession, turn over to 2 Timothy now, in you see how he follows this. This is fantastic. He's talking about the first time he went to Rome and, got, and stood before the magistrate. He says in verse 16, 2 Timothy 4, 16, he says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Sounds like Stephen, doesn't it? In Acts chapter 7. He says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. He did not get killed at that first time. 
he lived longer. Matter of fact, he got out and went and did some more ministry, and then he came back. And he says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. You know, he's looking forward now, as he's departing, he's looking forward to the time in which he's going to be without sin. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. And Paul talks about this issue. He's delivering him from all those things. Aren't you, aren't you excited about the, of being able to be delivered from not only the sins of your own mind and flesh, but the sins of other people's minds and flesh? The sins of other people affect us more than our own. Because you can have hundreds of them working on you simultaneously. You, you're just you, yourself, and you, right? And it's all you got to deal with. But when other people are messing with you, what happens? You go through Paul's ministry in Acts and see how many times they gang up on him. And they gather all these women together and they, they get them all riled up and they gather these men together and they get them all riled up. And before you know it, it's one riot after another. They're always, there's always a crowd messing with him. Notice in Galatians what Paul says. He says in verse 5, 5, 5, he says, uh, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but in my mind, I have eternal life. That's the way I think about it. I don't hope to get it. I'm not trying to get it. I, I, I'm, I have it. Romans is the book that explains that to me. And the fact is that I am not only a person who knows that he has eternal life, I know that I'm just before God in every aspect. He does not have a single solitary sin to hold against me. And I'm including all the ones I have not committed. But I'm going to tell you that in the rest of my life, from today forward until the time I go to be with the Lord or the time I die... There are going to be multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of sin in my life, and in yours too. But there is a day in which we can, by faith, believe and understand, until we get to that point of Galatians 5.5, 5, that that hope of righteousness is not us getting righteousness out there in the future. It's, it's taking the righteousness of Christ that we now have and allowing it to reside in a brand new sinless body in which there is no possibility of sin. Isn't that great? We wait for the hope of righteousness, meaning that when righteousness is all we can do, it's all we know, it's all we'll be able to do because there won't be any sin up there. And, you know, that's an exciting prospect for a sinner, and it's especially exciting for an old sinner. Right, Frank? <laughs> yeah, Russ and Frank know more about the sin than you young guys do. I'm going to tell you, when you get older, you begin to not only realize how futile the idea of working for eternal life is, but you thank God more and more that you're already saved. You thank God that you, you have now what most of the world wants but will never get. Oscar used to always ask me, he says, Russ, if not you, who? If we don't go out and tell people the gospel of the grace of God, who is going to do that? Who's going to preach this? Who's going to give it out? Turn over to uh, Romans chapter 1, look at verse 17. Well, we are. We're going to give it out. But before you give it out, you have to know what it is. We used to say that a lot when we were kids, young guys. We'd say, what it is? What it is? What is it? What it is? Well, what it is, is the gospel. And that revelation, that revelation of the gospel of the grace of God, begins with the revelation of his son being resurrected from the dead. We do not serve a dead savior. It won't be Buddha on the throne. It won't be Hare Krishna on the, on the throne. And it certainly isn't going to be Allah on the throne. It's going to be the Son of God resurrected on the throne because that's where he is right now. He's already seated there. 
and he is now ruling and reigning in the heavenly places and eventually the things are going to happen that will come to pass in which all the things that Paul tells us will come to pass will come to pass. And we can, we can be rest assured. Now, you have opportunity to reach people. Look what he says in Romans chapter 1 and verse, let's go down into verse uh, 15. After he's, he's discussing this idea in this final one here, the purpose of the fruit, he wants them to have fruit. Notice what he says. He says, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He's not saying he wants to come and get them saved. He's writing to save people. He's already said that. But he's talking about coming there and preaching the, the whole message of it, the whole detail of it. What you find in Romans, uh, in the 16 chapters of Romans, is what he wants to give them. And when he begins to pin this, he's only in, you know, what we call the 15th verse in the introduction. He's just in the beginning of the letter. And he's going to try to give it all to them and... I'm wondering when he got done with this, whether he actually looked at it and said, wow, <laughs> I really didn't start out to do that. <laughs> you know, he might have just written down a letter. He's going to write a letter to somebody, you know. You sit down and write a little note to somebody and put it in the mail. You write a letter to somebody, put it in the mail. I have a brother that writes me letters all the time. He doesn't email. He doesn't even have a computer. He writes me letters all the time. And I tell you what, I love those letters because I get to read them and I read them over and I don't have to find them. I don't have to search for them. I don't have to turn the computer on. I just grab those letters. And I want to read what he said there. And one, of the, one day, here, just not too long ago, he wrote me a letter and I tell you what, I sat there and I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, you know what's so exciting about these letters is he's coming around. He's, he's got it. He's, he's, he's been trying to get it for so long, and now he's finally got it. And, and now he's growing and growing and growing and growing exponentially. It's fantastic. And, and you know, when he writes in this letter, he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel. He says in verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You see that? It, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And at this time in Paul's life and his ministry, this is around Acts 18 when this letter is being written, he is still going to the Jew first. And he continues that all the way up until the end of the book of Acts. Paul's ministry was to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And before Paul got saved and got that message from Jesus Christ, it was to Jews only. That's it. No Gentiles. And then with Paul, he begins it, and it goes to the Jew first, and then it goes to the Gentile. This is the gospel of the grace of God, and it continued all the way to the end of the book of Acts that way, and then at the end of the book of Acts, what do you have? It's going to go to the Jew and Gentile without distinction. Do you know where you find that? Book of Romans. That's why Romans follows Acts. It follows a transition book. Acts gets you from kingdom Judaism into the dispensation of grace. You see, Matthew over here, excuse me, over here, gets you into, from Old Testament Judaism, into the kingdom of Judaism. So you go from Old Testament Judaism into kingdom Judaism, then from kingdom Judaism into the body of Christ program, and then you're going to go where? You're going to go from here over into the next program, which is back into kingdom Judaism again. And that's going to be the consummation of it. <coughs> The whole history of Israel is unfinished business. It's never happened yet. It's like a starting, you know, at the starting gate. That when the horses come out of the starting gate, you ever see that? Some guy's just still sitting there. Everybody else is coming down the track and the gate wouldn't open for him. Or the horse is acting up. Or if you're watching motocross, the kids take off, right? And all of a sudden there's about three of them piled up in, <laughs> in front of the starting gate. They, they, it's unfinished. They don't finish the race. Theirs has, is yet to be finished. It's future. But in the meantime, guess what? We need some information to get us through. We need it. And this information is important. He says that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He says, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And notice, notice verse 17. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. It is revealed to us from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
Now we begin to get the idea that Paul's going to bring some things up from back here that are going to teach us about how these men had faith. I was telling uh, uh, Todd a while ago that in the book of Hebrews, you go to the Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Fame, that's the Hebrew Hall of Fame where all those 14 examples of Old Testament and pre-Old Testament saints are given. Okay, of, they, they demonstrate examples of their faith and how they did those things by faith. Every single example begins with by faith, by faith, by faith, or through faith, okay? And so you see that, and there's, there's never any example of anything that Paul ever did. I think that's strangely absent. Why is that distinction made? The same reason that in Romans to Philemon, there's not one instance of Paul ever talking about anybody back here as being examples specifically. Now, he does mention in 1 Corinthians 10 that the things that happened back there were examples. But I'm going to tell you, as you look at it, you, you, you see this very strange that Paul has a kind of a, a, a the balance is tipped a little bit. Everything that he uses in terms of examples from the value of the cross and the preaching of the cross are all about individuals that are in his ministry. He talks about Trophimus. He talks about uh, Timothy. He talks about these different men. And all these men, Titus and so forth, and they are all demonstrations of the fruit that he wants the Romans to have. Priscilla and Aquila, he says, Those, that couple laid down their own necks for me, he says. And all, all they were were people that were just making tents, minding their own business. And Paul comes up and begins to talk to them and says, Hey, I make tents. You got any work for me? Yeah, and before you know it, they're all traveling together. Well, if you go to the end of the book of Romans, you find out that Priscilla and Aquila have a church in their home in Rome. Along with all the other people that are there. And he's thanking God for Phoebe and all these different people because he had this entire huge entourage that really wasn't with him the whole time. It was just scattered throughout the empire. And they're all producing fruit. And Paul uses those people as an example of the fruits and, and, and the demonstration of what faith can do in this dispensation. I think it's interesting that, that you have that because this is really a distinction. He's not going to go back here under the law program and try to give those illustrations. Israel can go and get some benefit from those in the 70th week of Daniel on the trip. But for us today, I didn't raise my kids out of Proverbs or Psalms or any of those books back there trying to teach them just those things. I taught them Paul's epistles. And then with Paul's epistles, you go back and you confirm what Paul says with those books. But in among all those great verses in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms, you've got things that are law based and if you're not careful the children will listen to those things and say oh well that means I got to do this if they're reading them and studying them too much what happens if you read the law a lot under that program you're going to have a tendency to want to do things that way so Paul there's so many things that are distinctive uh, we said to you before the fact that Paul's name is on every single one of his epistles by his first name, beginning the first word in every one of his epistles is his own name. And, and it seems as though he, he's just such an egomaniac and a <laughs> everything is I, me, or my. Well, remember that's, those personal pronouns are by inspiration. And by inspiration, yes. And so what, what Jesus Christ is trying to get through to you is he is my man and I want you to listen to what he says. I asked the question this morning, we were talking about what, what is it that, that why does this man have 13 letters and, and you have nobody in the Bible writes 13 letters. You have no other person in the entire Bible that writes 13 epistles. And the only other person that comes close to writing as much in form of words is Moses. You see, there, there is a new thing happening now. This dispensation of the grace of God is not some, some thing that's just an extension or just an, a continuation of, of something here that Israel did and now it's morphed into this because that was God's will to do. No, 
This, this didn't just continue on with the wall up and go across there. It went down here like this, and they fell, and this wall was taken out of the way. He broke down that middle wall of partition, and that yellow section on the chart is where you see that, where it's completely broken down. When you break a wall down, you go through it. You punch a wall down, you go through it. Guy was talking last night about those guys over there in the Middle East fighting the ISIS fighters. They, he says they're like rats. They, they tunnel into the building. If you're in a building trying to get cover, they're already punching through the wall, coming in. He says they're like rats coming after us. And it's crazy. In, in Jericho, when the walls of Jericho fell down, uh, you would think, well, if, if a wall that big is going to come down, and that's a big wall. You think about a wall that's big enough to build houses on. That's a big wall, right? Those walls, when they fell down, they fell inward. They didn't fall backwards or straight down. When they said the shout and the walls fell down, they fell inward so that the Israelites could run up over them and get into the city. You see, God breaks these walls down when it's important to break them down. And the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile is now down. And this is a very, very important revelation. It is absolutely essential. Look at uh, this verse 18. Here's where the thing really starts taking off because he's talking to you about the gospel and how it's revealed from faith to faith. And now he's going to change and he's going to start going through this process of the gospel of Christ, which he begins there in, in verse 15 and goes all the way over to chapter 5, verse 21. In verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know, I, I spoke last week about suppressing the truth. You know, when Marty put his boot on that man's throat during the Bible conference up there in Chicago, we're at Judson College and got like 300 and some odd people in the place and Brother Jordan got a Molotov cocktail thrown at him, <laughs> and uh, luckily it didn't fire up the place, but I'm sitting in the balcony running the audio system with about uh, 75 or 100 teenagers, and uh, there was, man, I tell you what, there was chaos in that building, because they, they got this guy on the floor, and they're, you know, they're trying to subdue him, and uh, they were suppressing him, no doubt, and, and this is what people do with the truth. He says that they, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, this is a very important verse because this verse begins to demonstrate to you something about the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is not coming on us today. The wrath of God does not come to us in the dispensation of grace of God. We're not appointed under wrath, and we're not going to be appointed under wrath because the wrath today, the message about God's wrath today is not a message of wrath coming upon you and upon me for our sin or coming upon the world for its sin. It is a message of wrath delayed. The wrath has been delayed. The wall is broken down. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. And now God has a message, the message of the cross, and it has to go forward. It's got to be preached. And verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say it's being executed. It says it's revealed. And when you begin to reveal the wrath of God and you begin to show the wrath of God and you begin to demonstrate how mad God really is about this issue right here. We always talk about the cross in a positive viewpoint, don't we? most of the time. Not just the negative aspect. But there's one negative aspect of the cross you've got to keep in mind. God is not happy and yet, his program that we are in right now would have no purpose without it. Did this have to happen? Yes. But the fact is that the men that did it, did it by choice. And when they did it, they were given an opportunity to be forgiven for it. Didn't Peter say that on the day of Pentecost? Father, uh, he says it on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When Christ says that, Peter says, that I walked that you did it, the cross, through ignorance. You know, you'd think God would be pretty mad about that. But really, on the day of Pentecost, that's not the birthday or the beginning of the church, the body of Christ. That's the forgiveness of Israel. That's the forgiveness of what they did at that cross. 
And what really, what really gets upsetting is when he gives them an entire year to come to their senses and they refuse it. How does he declare his wrath? Does he just come back and smoke them? <laughs> does he come back in, in, in anger and judgment and, as Paul says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God? Does he do that? No, he does not. If you look at the chart there, you'll see that the very next thing to happen uh, on the calendar of events is what? The tribulation. And yet the tribulation does not come, but the dispensation of grace does. And as the dispensation of grace unfolds, and Paul's job is to do this, he's trying to show us now that God's grace has now, what? It is now forgiven everybody completely and totally on the basis of this cross. Why? Because the payment that was made there is sufficient for God, and he's happy with that payment. Nobody knew that. Who thought that? The apostles didn't know anything about it. They didn't understand anything about how the cross works into the kingdom until Paul explained the cross to them. You see, the wrath of God cannot come upon earth and do what it's going to do according to prophecy until God is finished building the church the body of Christ. The fact that people don't understand this is simply they don't understand the reason and the purpose for the body of Christ. Why is that? Go over to the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians teaches you that there is a need to fill up those principalities and powers. And those principalities and powers are going to be kicked out. They've already been kicked out of the third heavens up here. They've been kicked into the stellar heavens, and now they're going to be in the tribulation. They'll go into the earth, and then they're going into hell. So their trek is always just down the stairway, whereas people go, wow, that's great. Hallelujah, the angels exclaim. When that happens, it's fantastic. But the question never comes up is, well, who's going to take their place? We are. And Ephesians is the second doctrinal book in, in Paul's epistles that explains all of that. So you see, Romans is followed by 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians, which is all about the gospel. Ephesians is the mystery. It's followed by Philippians and Colossians, and, and, and it's all about Paul's secret purpose in this. And then in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's going to give you the information about uh, the idea of the two comings so that you don't get them confused. The rapture, 1 Thessalonians. The second coming, 2 Thessalonians. So those are very important doctrinal books. Look over at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Beautiful phrase here. Ephesians chapter, did I say 5? Ephesians 6, excuse me. He says pray, right? Verse 18, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then in verse 19, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known, now notice this phrase, the mystery of the gospel. Where is the mystery of the gospel at? It's in Ephesians. Matter of fact, it begins in Romans because the first mention of the church, the body of Christ, is in Romans. The first mention of the revelation of the mystery is in Romans. So the seeds of it are in Romans, and it's not flushed out until you get over to Ephesians. And when you get over to Ephesians, you can hardly contain yourself. It's like one of those balloons we get for the kids. You see them at Disney when they're walking around with these balloons, and they let one go and it goes up. <laughs> you can't contain yourself. When you realize that your entire purpose in life and destiny and everything that God wants for you all has to do with going up. It has nothing to do with staying here. You might quit singing marching to Zion or Beulah land because that's not where your destination is, you see. You're a heavenly creature by nature. 
You're prehistoric by nature because you were a secret in the mind of God, and now you're a heavenly natured creature because you're going to go up into the principalities and powers and dominions, and you're going to be installed in them, and that will be your new place forever. Government jobs are not really highly popular today in, 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 from those who are not in the government. The people that are in there love them, okay? But the people that are looking at what these people are doing, they don't think they should have them. Or they think they're being paid too much. Or that they're absolutely, they're just idiotic in the things they do. This lady yesterday, this, I, I love this, this was so funny. The, the big thing right now with the, 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 between Common Core and, and conventional teaching uh, my, my wife has a, a lady that works for her who's trying to work through Common Core with her kids and she's pulling her hair out with it. And this lady, she gets up in front of this audience and she says, I have a, uh, I have a, a problem for you. I want you to solve. And she says, uh, think in your mind. And she shows this little thing up there and it's got 18 circles on it. And she says, I want you to divide this number, th these 18 circles, I want you to divide this so that you end up with this number. And somebody, somebody immediately says like, 15 or whatever they said. They said a particular number. And she says, yes, that's correct. She said, solving this problem the old way is a two-step problem. In Common Core, to solve that same problem is an 18-step problem. The kids have to draw 18 circles and 18 hashtags and 18 numbers, and they have to have all this stuff on their page <laughs> or whatever, and they go through this step, right? And they work it out on paper to get that answer. I don't know about you, but when I went to school, I used flashcards. And I know what 12 times 12 is by memory. I don't have to figure it out with a calculator. You see, they, they're trying to make things harder. And the reason they're doing it is because their thinking has been skewed by the world system. So we look at, the, mil we look at the, the, the military or we look at the government or whatever, and we said, that we got to get rid of that. Change it out. Get somebody better. i got news for you. There is nobody better. But there is a better government coming. And that government shall be on his shoulders, and it's the government of the kingdom of heaven on the earth, and it also transcends also out here into the heavenly places. The kingdom of God takes place in two realms, in the heavenly places and on the earth. Ephesians will open your eyes to that, and it will help you understand exactly who you are, where you're supposed to be in the future, and what you're supposed to be doing now while you're here. I love to think about those things. I hope you do too. And as we go through some of these things next week, we'll talk more about the details as we get a little further down into Romans about the beginning of those indictment, indictments from Paul on, on the sin issue. By the time you get to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, you're going to have a better knowledge and a better understanding of sin than you've ever had in your life, and it's the best thing that could ever happen to a sinner, is to understand what sin really is. Okay? That's really, really important. And you're going to be able to look at these things and understand them so that you can see what the definition of sin is. Uh, what sin is, what sin does, and so forth. And that's really important. So the next big section that we're going to go into as we go into this gospel of Christ is about the sin issue and about the problem of being unjust before God. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and we thank you so much for the gospel of grace that's been committed to us. We thank you, Lord, that this is a, a time of grace and a time when your wrath is being held back, that it's delayed, and we don't know how long it's going to continue. But we do know that we have a message and that message is committed to us. It's committed to our trust and we have to be able to learn it before we can uh, go out and tell others about it. We thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.